Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Quitero, and I'm here with my co-host, Brian Fabian Crane. Today, we're speaking with Alessio Del Monte, who is the founder of PyDAO. And before we talk to Alessio, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Gnosis Safe is a smart contract wallet for securely managing digital assets. What makes Gnosis so safe different is that it allows you to define customized access permissions. Digital assets on Web3 are usually controlled by a single private key, which poses a challenge because privacy keys can get lost or compromised. Now, on top of that, users are forced to trust individuals holding single private keys to govern highly valuable assets and protocols. Gnosis Safe enables users to control digital assets with much more granular permissions involving multiple private keys, a subset of which is required for executing transactions. And these keys can be stored on different hardware or software wallets and even shared across multiple people. Gnosis Safe's extra layer of security and personalization makes it the most trusted Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs, which we'll be talking about today. Maybe they're using Gnosis Safe. We'll, we'll find out. Uh, who already use it to store more than 80 billion in USD uh, today. On top of that, uh, Gnosis Safe provides opportunities for developers to plug into the platform and build their own dApps and permission modules. This is Gnosis Safe to learn more and to get started with your own safe. Uh, Alessio, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, are you using Gnosis Safe? Is, does uh, PyDAO use Gnosis Safe? We actually do. Yeah, we do have a bunch of different safes. Like uh, uh, right now, PyDAO um, does use a combination of an Aragon DAO together with a couple of different safes for managing ops and also some um, yeah treasury operations. So, you know, great product. Shout out to, St to Stefan and the entire team. Yeah, I so said you're also using Aragon, and I, I wanted to ask you about like how, I mean, I, I, I have never used that product, but I've always been like really interested in it uh, just from like a product perspective, like, and I'm, I'm curious, like how, um, how easy it is to like manage a DAO uh, with Aragon, maybe something, we, this is something we can talk about later. Um, but first, you know, tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved in crypto. Yeah, of course. Like I... Well, I've been a developer most of my life, uh, soft soft engineer, uh, you know, started in Web 2.0. Um, I've been involved in a variety of different Web 2.0 startups, like from, you know, advertising, logistics and a couple of other things. And then eventually stumbled into crypto um, while I was working on a mesh networking uh, project, um, actually pretty early, like at least uh, I read the paper of Bitcoin, I think it was like 2013, and I was tweeting about it a little bit, uh, but never got into the building uh, until uh, some point in 2017. Um, so since then, uh, I've been really focusing on building uh, different things, uh, mostly uh, retail-oriented products uh, from wallet solution and payment processors, and eventually got into solidity development. Um, and then I ended up you know, building PyDAO. Like what, what attracted you to crypto and then uh, what was sort of, you know, like why, why PIDO? Like why start that? I think that's a great question. Um, I think besides having, well, like a, a, pre, a little bit of an, an attitude against authority, like and a bunch of other things, uh, which are definitely relatable to a lot of crypto people. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that too much, uh, but it's definitely a component. Uh, most recently, well, mo most importantly, like along the way, I kind of realized uh, a massive wealth redistribution was happening within the crypto space. Like, and that was potentially like a one life changing opportunity, not only for myself, but like for, you know, maybe the vast majority of people. Like we are in the, in the business right now of creating a new economy effectively, like we can impact, uh, potentially billions of people. And, uh, and I always thought, okay, you know, what if this time is, is different, right? Like, you know, what, what is going to happen having this kind of global perspective, like, and then when everybody joins, um, are, are things going to be different? And I think, I think they are like, uh, I've been, you know, for years lurking in other internet communities, like even in the gaming communities and see, you know, 11 years old being like, you know, 10, 20 X times better than anybody else like doing what they do, right? And th those are pretty complex systems. So what happens when you open the gate, like, and everybody can build whatever they want? So I think, I think that's extremely fascinating. And, uh, you know, building on that idea, um, we eventually ended up with, with part of an existing community, like, uh, which was around uh, thinking, how can we facilitate the process 
uh, how can we boost accessibility and most important focus on you know wealth creation uh, for everyone and more importantly automated wealth creation so so you said you you guys ended up or you ended up with like a community you know did you sort of like develop the original idea of PyDAO and then your know, community formed or was it sort of like a community first that then came up with this uh like vision or like can you tell us a that, bit about sort of the like ladder. the genesis yeah so how, how, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely what, the how so did like this a, community form? So, so there was like at the very beginning when Compound V1 came out, right? There was like a little bit of a community in crypto Twitter um, trying to figure out uh, how much you can push this passive income meme forward, right? Like how much can you end up paying with those interest from Compound and other uh, sort of different protocols. Eventually that formed into a Telegram group uh, which was called Earn DAO, which uh, was initially arbitraging between uh, DeFi interest rate uh, through a smaller DAO, but basically manually through the DAO, right? Like then eventually some protocol came out into like you know, yield optimizers and idle finance and all these kind of things, right? Uh, but then uh, um, as we have been working on that, like from that smaller DAO, which was called Earn DAO, eventually uh, yeah, a subset of those people uh, uh, started thinking, okay, what's really missing in the space right now? And we started thinking, in terms of what if we create uh, an asset allocation DAO, like, you know, sort of a group of people which uh, is strongly focused on finding different asset allocation, which are trying to answer different things uh, and, you know, design, basically tokenized portfolio to some degree, uh, which answered, yeah, uh, have different benefit from different people. And uh, that's how it all started. Uh, that eventually came out into, together into a forum post, uh, which I read, yeah, I wrote like uh, one year ago, I think one year and one week ago at this point. So we are, yeah, we can celebrate the birthday as well. And uh, and that's how PyDAO started. I wanted to ask you, because I noticed in your website that you talk about like financial inclusion. Um, and I wonder if this is something that, because it's, it's a term that gets used a lot in crypto. And you know, what, what does it mean to you? And how, how do you define financial inclusion? Right, I think that's, well, that's a great question. Like, I'm definitely pro the idea that people have to, uh, well, first educate themselves, like, and, you know, put out the effort. But I would also argue that a lot of the operation that people do, like, which are a little bit more financially savvy, can potentially be automated, right? And if they can be automated, uh, it also means that, uh, you know, you can create products uh, which are designed for, you know, for the busy people or for the ones who... Uh, don't need to know exactly all the nitty gritty of uh, all that specific strategy or like all those assets, the way they work, right? At the end of the day, people, you know, just go to the kitchen and open the fridge, like right? they don't understand how the fridge works, right? Uh, so can you do that for financial operation or, or more generally speaking for asset management? And that's really what we are focusing here. Okay, so in your view, it's more of a, of a, no a question about like knowledgeability about financial instruments than it is necessarily about like having access to those services that's that's definitely one component the second component is can we build tools uh that facilitate that like uh, you know in terms of lowering the cost or making it more convenient to people and that's uh, you know for instance where the oven came out like uh, the entire idea of the oven uh, within the PyDAO ecosystem and uh, uh, serves the, the purpose of, you know, lowering the barrier for people to mint in pies. And, you know, we can talk about that if you like. Yeah. Well, so let's, let, let's talk about PyDAO. I'm curious, like, where all this uh, uh, kind of branding around pies and baking came, came about? Yeah, the branding, uh, uh, well, it comes down, uh, it boils down to the fact that, as I said, like, we eventually spent a lot of time as a community thinking about asset allocation, and we were using a lot of pie charts, like, to represent those. So eventually, uh, this entire uh, you know this entire thing turned out into a meme. It's like okay, uh, you know we're building pies, like uh, you know we it's the bakery, like and then uh, um, was adopted uh, by the community uh, pretty well. We right now we actually have like almost a, a sort of a secret group for stakers, which is called the kitchen, right? And our newsletter is called Inside the Bakery, and we have been following along those lines uh, since the beginning. Yeah, it's definitely like a pretty cool meme. And I think like 
memes memes help communities stay together and like it sort of gives them i mean like you should think about you know anthropologically speaking you know like how like religion sort of like has all these memes that kind of keep keeps communities together and i think like a lot of good crypto projects um have sort of taken uh taken on this approach you know knowingly or unknowingly but um it definitely works uh, so you know what like describe what what is pi dao like in, sort of in a nutshell like how does it um like what's the vision for for pi dao so if i have to condense it into a sentence i'm gonna say we are a dao that serves as a you know decentralized asset manager for tokenized portfolio uh with a mission to bring automated wealth creation to everyone uh, who has an internet collection. Like, I think that's a way, a good way to represent that. Um, in, what that means is that PyDAO offers a variety of different products at this point, uh, mostly tokenized portfolio, which gives you access to a uh, you know, curated basket of assets. Uh, you might think sometimes more uh, you know, about those things like ETF to some degree, but like uh, on on steroids, right? Because like this is crypto, like and we are using DeFi protocols, so like you can combine uh, not only the assets but also create you know intrinsic productivity uh, and you know re-leverage all the different opportunities that DeFi has to offer, from you know lending to staking to generate yield, and uh, even be a proxy for participating in governance uh, into other DAOs. Right. One thing I'm curious about. Like there are, there are some other protocols, right? Like for example, set protocol, right? They've had their, um, their, some sort of like token that's, um, like this DeFi index token, I think, right? Where they're like, is, how is it similar or how is it different from PyDog? Yeah. Like, so, um, from a protocol perspective, there are definitely like some similarities. Uh, since a set protocol is also sort of a basket making protocol in that sense. Um, and, uh, and I think like one of the things that we are trying really to achieve here, like from a community perspective is one, not limit necessarily the scope to baskets. So like, that's one thing, uh, we have been starting by making those allocations and it's been working out well for us. Uh, but we're also more, a lot more interested in, uh, other type of tokenized portfolio, like, you know, Either that being, you know, single asset or even uh, uh, sort of more complex things like, you know, options, portfolios or, or whatnot. Like, uh, can we build like different type of funds uh, which perform different kind of things within the DAO? And uh, um, from my understanding, like uh, uh, that's uh, one key difference that, that is really sort of putting these two things apart. Like they, they made up like a protocol which is open to, for everyone to use. Uh, but they don't have that vision necessarily. Uh, they are trying to be um, more of a, like a black rock of crypto, if that makes sense, which is, uh, you know, very large uh, indexes, uh, not super maybe innovative just because of the nature of those indexes. So I, there is a difference in there. Like I also think like black rock is great, but like it's also pretty evil. Right? So like hopefully <laughs> we are not going there with crypto. So what are the different components of PyDAO? So like, you know, maybe just kind of to break things up a little bit here. So you get the DAO and then there's the smart pools, the vaults, and then the oven. And I think there's probably some other components. So can you kind of like, you know, break this down? Like there's a, if, if we go, if you go to the, web, the, Pi, the PyDAO website, there's like a great chart there of, you know, all the different components kind of working together. And um, I wonder, it's, it's kind of hard to do this without the visual, but maybe kind of explain how all these components work together uh, and who are the different participants involved. Of course. So yeah, like at the very beginning, there is obviously the DAO and the community, like uh, which makes and govern all these different products. Uh, for the current line of product we are managing, there are basically two categories. Uh, one is our so-called smart pools and the other one are pie vaults. Uh, smart pool was the very first line of product, which we implemented as a custom implementation of the balancer smart pools. So we were basically using uh, uh, this idea of doing LP, LP, like uh, LP tokens or like uh, uh, liquidity pools uh, in the form of, of basically index funds, which will be auto rebalancing through trading uh, and generating yield in the form of exchange fees between the assets. So that's been uh, uh, one of the first implementation that we pushed like and uh, we still have a couple of those. BCP is a good example. 
so BC Peel, for instance, uh, is an allocation which gives you equal uh, balance between Ethereum, Bitcoin, and DeFi coins. And at the same time, it's automatically generating three layers of fees from, from basically the trading happening within the pool, either between you know, BTC and ETH or ETH and, B, uh, and DeFi, but also because uh, DeFi++, which is our DeFi allocation, is also composed of two sub-indexes. So like we have been always focusing on this composability aspect so that we can create this kind of structure, uh, which means you know, BCP is earning uh, that layer of fee, but also the, the fees of trading between the two sub-indexes, DeFi plus S and DeFi plus L. So be between that and Pi Volts, there is a fundamental different, difference. Uh, Pi Volts are, uh, mm, there is no active trading happening within the pool. Uh, but you gave up that for, in exchange for a couple of more things, which is intrinsic productivity of assets. So those assets can be used within a lending protocol, can be used within native staking. Uh, for instance, we do stake you know, sushi, we do stake uh, Wi-Fi, we can use wire and bolts within and whatnot. And they can also yield bounds between uh, you know, the most interesting opportunities uh, over there. So if one single token within the pool is you know, gaining uh, more yield within another um, sort of another Yandin protocol or sort of another y bolts, like uh, the, the pool will automatically bounce to that. So it's kind of bridging together, like this yield bouncing concept um, together with index bounds, if that makes sense. The Pi vaults are, I guess, analogous to a sort of ETF um, where, you know, where basically you have got you know, multiple tokens. When you buy one of these uh, indices, you you are essentially buying into the performance of multiple tokens. So, you know, looking here at the website, um, there's like the the DeFi large cap, which is like the larger DeFi protocols. Then you have the smaller cap. Um, there's a USD uh, pool, uh, which or vault, which has like all the USD stable coins. And then interestingly, there's also like a, an NFT um metaverse uh index which uh you know has you know, holds like several nft projects what are some of the and then and there's just like strategies so uh, what are the strategies that are being deployed here for each of these indices so i've noticed for example that you know if i take the uh, DeFi large cap i'll see that okay there's 20 percent allocation in link and that strategy, you know, it's appears to be like lended on Aave and then Uni, you know, has like 15% and it's lended on Compound and some of them don't have. So are all of these tokens then just, you know, being, um, you know, staked and either or, or put as capital in lending pools? Like, and then how is that being managed? Yeah, whenever that is possible, uh, the answer is yes. So like some of these tokens will, uh, you know, it's possible to lend them uh, mostly either in lending protocols or into, we use y uh quite a bit for generating yield uh, in that sense. We don't do liquidity pools uh, directly since that will give pretty much like exposure to something else, which we don't want necessarily in the index. And... Um, yeah, so like, uh, you know, whatever like is possible. Like loss, for example, or? Come again? Like like impermanent loss, for example? Like for you'd be exposing yourself yeah, to yeah, and like you will also yeah. need to okay. like, you know, sell those assets a little bit in order to, you know, gain whatever is the other asset in the, in the pair. So anything yeah. which is considered to be sort of uh, almost risk-free uh, in terms of lending, then we, we are going to do. Um, some of the strategies are also whitelisted, including a tokenized staking. That's the case for Sushi, for instance, and X Sushi and a couple of others. Uh, so, so far we have been focusing really on only whitelisting tokenized strategies, right? And the reason for that is that you want to create the situation where the index is always fully collateralized. And then in the worst case scenario, you can always exit in the tokenized version of that token. Uh, moving forward, uh, we are actually gonna probably go through the route of having also non-tokenized allocation and having a slightly more complex redeeming mechanism. Uh, but that will enable so much opportunities, right? And uh, so I think it's it's well worth it. Okay, because like all of these pools are fully backed by the uh, by the tokens that are allocated. Is that that is correct? It's a one hundred percent back here? and uh, and non custodial uh, from a user perspective. So like any time okay. anyone can you know go and either mint or redeem. Uh, their pie for the underlying assets uh, anytime they want. You mentioned that they're in the future you're looking at perhaps 
um, having uncollateralized indices? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say uncollateralized. I just oh. said uh, not not untokenized indexes. So like, you know, some of the staking opportunities or some other uh, DeFi opportunities are not necessarily in the form of a token. Uh, so in order to leverage those, uh, you will need to have some sort of support uh, that will enable, for instance, to, I don't know, stake on convex finance or something like that, right? Even if they don't give you a token back. And so, so you, but if you, if you guys do staking, for example, in a particular portfolio, um, and let's say there's some unbonding period or other thing, then like, how does this redemption work, like for the underlying asset? Right, like we are not doing any staking which does have an, uh, sort of a buffer time, like at this point. If okay. we do, like uh, what is going to happen is probably there are going to be either windows of redemption, so that, uh, you know, that can be done uh, for sure within a you know, specific window of time, right? Or we are going to only deploy, let's say, 80% of the pool, like and keep 20% for sort of a buffer pool, right? So that people can enter and exit through the buffer uh, up to some limits. And that's uh, like a very similar concept to the utilization rate, uh, for instance, in lending pools, uh, more generally speaking. So it would be everybody can basically exit at any time up to 20%, for instance, and then uh, uh, after that, goes through, like, you know, you need to wait until the next rebalance event, you know, next week. That's interesting, eh? But like, for example, also, you wouldn't have, what about NFTs? Can you have like portfolios of uh, NFTs? That is actually a very, very interesting question because like there are right now two discussions happening within the community. One uh, for having a, a floor, uh, floor NFT found in place, which is called PFP. So like you could uh, leverage the NFTX uh, vault mechanism uh, to basically create an index found of you know apes and punks and uh, all the popular NFTs uh, using their floor found. Uh, I'm actually designing like something slightly different, which is more of a curated NFT uh, found, uh, because I think the issue with the current design of NFT founds is that uh, they are naturally made to not hold uh, valuable NFTs, right? Like they are only made to hold floor price tokens, which are great. Like and you know, Wait, probably what's the most a floor liquid. price token? Um, so like when you see like a collection of NFTs, um, with the well, the definition of, of floor price is basically what is the lowest price anybody would pay for for an NFT in that collection, right? So like if you uh, you know look at you know cool cats or something like that, right? There are cool cats which are worth tens of ETH, right? But then the floor price is around 10 ETH because the lowest NFT which is currently being sold is priced at 10 ETH. So uh, there are some funds which basically enable to, you know, bring together into a basket all the different floor, uh, floor priced NFTs and then put them together. Like uh, we, NFTX uh, is, is doing that pretty, pretty well. Like we've been working with them also for the play uh, allocation, which you were looking at before, uh, Sebastian. And NFTX is also like a token listed in there. So we actually do have some of these funds within play. Like, and you can get exposure to punks, for instance, and, uh, and some others. Uh, but the issue with that is that like those are floor tokens, right? Like uh, they are only the lowest price of NFT you can get from that collection. But I think we actually want to get to a place where you get exposure to, a, to you know, very valuable NFTs. Like the one you know, they will, you know, go up in price significantly because they are very rare. So in this, in this play vault, are you guys actually holding these NFTs? Uh, we are holding the floor found, which is holding the NFTs. Okay, right. Okay, got it. So you're not actually holding the NFT, you're holding a token that a tokenized represents version the floor of the price Correct. of... Okay, I see. So it's like an NFT derivative. One thing I'm like curious, so, you know, you, you gave the analogy of like of ETFs, right? And of course, ETFs are like, I think you've pointed out on your website as well, like super widely used, super popular uh you know many benefits to etfs right i guess the main ones being there's a lot of diversification and uh and low costs right i think compared to like uh, actively managed funds now in the case of an etf 
you know, I guess there's, there's still some sort of manager, right, that like does this rebalancing. And, and of course, also with ETFs, right, I think you have, uh, you know, you have some kind of like range of, you know, maybe there are some things where it's like, you know, purely formulaic. And, you know, it's just about applying that formula. And then I think there may be other things where it's a bit more, you know, there's more degrees of subjectivity. And there's, there's still a bit of a role of like, you know, some kind of fund manager. And then, of course, you can, you can go to other funds, right, like more actively managed fund where there's maybe more of a reliance on, you know, somebody making some decisions. Like, can you explain a little bit, like, how, how does the decision making around you know what one of these portfolios invests in when there are changes made to it like how does that process work well i'm gonna say oh the entire process looks like this right uh, we are a community-based project as such like the entire community is basically responsible to one define a methodology that uh, whatever the allocation we are talking about let's say is play is gonna follow through over the months and update that accordingly if you know, things change. Like that methodology can include a variety of different input value. Like, uh, you know, you can have constraints related to market cap or like liquid markets. Uh, you can make sure, uh, you know, if we are uh, in the slippage for a determined like amount of 100K, uh, for instance, is minus 1%, which is like all rules, for instance, we implement in some of the products we have, including play. And then, uh, you know, you can, uh, also include all sorts of things in terms of, you know, number of holders, like, and really create a methodology uh, which defines the product uh, within, uh, you know, their unique characteristics. Uh, but as a community-based project, like the entire uh, sort of due diligence assessment, right, once the methodology is set, is basically externalized through the community, through contributors, and it's, uh, you know, a pretty independent process, right? Uh, whoever proposes a new allocation, like, we are all... You know, incentivized to go in there, look into it. We're gonna uh, have an acceptance criteria uh, sheet, uh, which gets updated frequently, and uh, that determines you know whatever tokens are making the pass or not. Ultimately, uh, each decision is up to the community, right? And even if uh, as much as structure it can be, like there is always a final vote saying, okay, we have been analyzing like these new ten candidates for like a month. These are the reports of all these analysis. Uh, let's have like a one final stamp of approval uh, for which one is going to be included or not. And uh, that's how the process looks like. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, if, if we again go sort of to the ETF analogy, right? In, in the ETF mm -hmm. example, I guess you have like, uh, like different, you know, different entities, different like fund managers, like determining different ETFs. I mean, here, you know, we were speaking about like different portfolios mm -hmm. that are quite different, right? Probably have different types of expertise and different people would be better. But is, is it like one governance of the entire DAO that kind of manages all the different portfolios that are part of PyDAO? Or did you imagine that? Like, because it doesn't sound very scalable to me. Well, the, the thing is like, uh, you can have working groups within the DAO, right? Like, and then you can have a specialized team taking care of a specific index, but that doesn't mean they are outside of the umbrella of the DAO. And I think uh, uh, that actually uh, is the way to go because like the general DAO, uh, it, 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 yeah, you, we need to go like a little bit deeper into why, uh, you know, the DAO is important and why like voting is important, like, because uh, you are correct. There are like some sort of specialized expertise which will be needed for specific product and more in general, like it doesn't make sense for everybody to make decision. And that's why you have sort of verticals. And I think uh, a good example of that uh, has been happening within the NFT space where we are actually engaging with a different community only to take care of a single allocation for NFT projects, right? And that's because we didn't have uh, internal expertise to do that on our own. So that makes the process a little bit more scalable but it also creates the condition for them to behave and act within the DAO under the ultimate control of, of the token holders, uh, which basically act as a sort of a subjective oracle if they made a good, you know, a good job or not. And, uh, and in general, we also like implement 
ways to incentivize that behavior uh, through this thing that we, you know, we are using, which are called uh, KPI options, which are basically related to the performance of those indexes so that you know, verticalized group can, you know, are actually rewarded for what they achieve. To answer your question, uh, everything happens within the umbrella of the DAO. There are uh, sort of independent single working groups taking care of single products. And there are incentive structure for those single working groups uh, based on performance of those products. Yeah, so then, I mean, there, were, there was a post written about the, the methodology for how pies are, are built. And, you know, maybe that's a good segue into, you know, the governance aspect here, which I think is fairly interesting and perhaps like one of the most the novel things about this project. Um, you know, at a high level, walk us through, you know, how... Um, how pies are built like through these working groups and maybe, you know, uh, from there, how the government governance plays into that process, you know, particularly through the DOE and veto tokens. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. Like I think, um, well, in terms of the, the construction of new products, like it all starts within the governance forum uh, of the DAO, like uh, uh, either a group of people or someone comes out with an idea uh, for an allocation which uh, is formalized into what we call a PIP, a pie improvement proposal, uh, which is basically like a formal proposal for the, for the allocation. We, uh, different allocation can have different methodology. We have sort of a general rule of thumb for anyone who wants to, uh, you know, gets into a market weighted allocation. So like we are gonna look at a couple of things. Uh, that's exactly what's described within uh, that forum post, which is not only related to market cap, but also underlying liquidity. And that's necessary because we want to make sure that uh, if large capital enters the space uh, or enters the pie, like uh, slippage is under control. Uh, so we look at all these uh, things, like, and once the models are um, sort of run out uh, and the discussion has been going through, uh, we try to achieve what, you know, we like to think about as off-chain, let's call it uh, off-chain rough consensus within the community. So like the discussion will be uh, going for a couple of weeks, sometimes a month or two. Uh, we will be looking at the product if it does make sense or not. Uh, we'll be looking at a different candidate. We will make the matrix of inclusion, like, you know, whoever makes the cut or not. And then we're going to do a final vote um, to make sure that, uh, you know, comes to reality. And then after that, uh, if the specific allocation does um, sort of include specific trigger for rebalancing, then uh, that's where the rebalancing will happen. Uh, so some allocations will uh, basically say something like, okay, if you, uh, you know, if a single token is over 30%, then that triggers a rebalancing immediately, right? And uh, this needs to happen. Uh, yeah, there are like a number of rules. It depends on the, on the allocation. Uh, but there are like a couple of different rules um, which, which can trigger the rebalancing. And this entire governance process like happens mostly off chain, but then eventually it gets notarized either on chain or like through the snapshot platform, uh, through voting by token holders. And most recently that, uh, you know, went through a big upgrade, like as we've been uh, transforming the entire way the governance system work uh, through the introduction of Vido. Yeah, the entire concept about Vido is actually uh, very simple. Like uh, uh, we have been thinking a lot since the beginning of the DAO, how can we make sure we balance uh, short-term interest with long-term interest for token holders? And that's one of the key questions which I think every community is asking themselves and uh, how to create that kind of long-term horizon in decision-making. And uh, the reason why you want to do that is like, you know, they, they are simple to understand, but like they basically create, uh, you know, the, the groundwork to have a mentality which is focused on impact, which is make, making sure that you are investing on the right thing, uh, including, you know, innovation, which is eventually what is going to lead to success over time, right? The, cap the capacity to sort of reinvent yourself as an organization and make sure that, you know, you don't stagnate. Taking all these things into consideration, uh, we've been rolling out a new governance systems, which uh, does require token holders to basically, you know, declare their commitment to the DAO and then, and then say, okay, I, um, you know, I'm going to stake like my tokens from a time span, which is of at least six months. Uh, to a maximum of three years. And, uh, and by doing that, I don't only stake, but that's the only way I can participate into governance. Uh, we believe that gives, you know, holders a strong reason to take responsibility uh, for achieving the mission of the DAO and uh, also 
pretty much act as an owner instead of a, uh, instead of a passive uh, you know, actor within the ecosystem. And then uh, tokens, so it's like some kind of inflation is given out to the governance participants to incentivize that. Uh, no, not all. Not also. It's actually not inflation. So the thing is, like, we are going to redistribute. Uh, so there are like a couple of components. Components number one is the commitment part, which happens through the staking and gives you access to governance power. Uh, and then once you have governance power, right, you need to exercise that. And then uh, we like to call this concept as governance mining. And the basic idea is that, uh, you know, the DAO over time will accrue a bunch of fees and they will accrue a bunch of different revenues, uh, on, also coming through a totally different working group, which is the treasury group, uh, which does active farming with the assets within the DAO. And uh, that's actually pretty substantial. Like, uh, so we want to make sure those revenues are redistributed to the people who, you know, who work to make that happen. Like, and then uh, uh, that's how we define the idea of participation. So active participants will receive like a slice of the of the rewards either coming from the pie or the treasury farming uh, in the in the form of a basket of tokens what that means is that the rewards are not actually given within the DAO token itself and they are not related to the price of dough are instead a collection of different fees uh, made of different tokens so like the very first distribution next month uh, which is the very first distribution of slice will be comprised of a variety of different tokens, including, you know, BAL and CRV and CVX and all the different things that the treasury has been actively producing through treasury management. I actually think that is the probably the first time like uh, people are rewarded for participating in governance, uh, not within the token, with the same token of the governance uh, itself. And I think that's pretty novel. Yeah, and practically speaking, what have been the effects of this? So like I'm I'm curious actually like you know, and a broader question is like how how big is the community and you know, what kind of governance participation are you seeing? Uh like what's the percentage of, you know, token holders or like of tokens that are that are actively participating in governance? So like this entire program has been starting this month. So like uh we are now 13 days. Uh, actually no, 9 days in because we started on the 4th. And uh, we have seen uh, over 26% of the circulating supply being staked, uh, roughly like 5 million, uh, a little bit more, 5.7 million. Actually, I need to check, like it's, uh, it's going uh, pretty fast. And uh, so, so far we count uh, 140 different token holders, like within the new governance system. As the word is spreading, like this is uh, uh, sort of getting bigger, especially as people realize like, sort of the order of magnitude of the payout, which is obviously like a big incentive to get in quick, right? Because we are actually now, uh, like the entire distribution will be uh, related to everything which is in the treasury accumulated so far. So I think it's uh, across like next to 1.5, 1.4 million right now uh, within within token holders. And uh, in terms of the impact we have been seeing, um, it's actually quite interesting because like since we have been rolling out this this new system uh we have been well seeing like the entire community come alive you know once more or in a completely different way uh they all shifting mentality like in this idea okay how do we make sure uh by the way the vast majority of the tokens are now staked for three years so it's a pretty long commitment and uh, that's generating like a variety of different uh initiative on now we can make sure like that uh you know, after those three years, like the entire value of the DAO will be way larger. So yeah, like we are going to actually do like the very first, uh, the very first governance vote um, next week after Monday 18th uh, with the new system. So I'm pretty excited to see like sort of the participation rate. I expect that to be close to 100%. So I, I guess we will see. I'd like to go deeper into KPI options and the role that they play in, you know, determining, for example, like allocations in a in a vault. Right. So the KPI does not have anything like related to to the allocation itself. So like, uh, let me briefly explain what a KPI is first. Right. So uh, it's basically this idea pioneered by the UMA team of creating tokens which are following a key performance indicator. And that can be pretty much anything. 
Uh, in our specific case, we are using those like in either two ways. Uh, one, which is uh, we are going to incentivize liquidity, which is staked within a single product. And then the number of TBL within that product, uh, it's what's used by the Oracle uh, of the UMA uh, KPI option to basically do the settlement. Or uh, more specifically, uh, as for today, we are doing a KPI option which incentivizes people uh, to find new stakers, like and expand the community. And uh, that specifically is actually running out also this month. And the way it's going to work is, um, you know, we're going to have six months of time and then we're going to look at the total amount of tokens staked. And then it depends on the outcome. Like that KPI option will convert up to 5 million DAO token, which is the token of the governance uh, we are using. Uh, in a pretty asymmetrical way, which means that there are steps in the middle, like, and obviously uh, within the three steps, like the, lar the last one is the largest one. So like if we can manage to, to get to that one, like everybody gets like an, uh, another big additional payout. And that's a similar way we're doing for pies. As we engage with different groups or like with specific working groups, we want to make sure those people are incentivized, you know, to do a good job in accruing, well, in collecting, you know, value for the product, right? So you can design a program which is which is basically saying, okay, you're gonna release this, you know, we're gonna release the epicenter product, right? Like, and you guys are gonna manage an allocation. You guys are ahead of the curve, know what you're doing. And the way we're gonna incentivize that is, once that come out, like uh, if that product gets one million TBL, then you're gonna get, you know, this much, like one hundred token or one hundred thousand token, let's say, right? But if it gets like five million TBL, then you're gonna get, you know, three times that and so on and so forth. So you can create sort of a step function uh, to make sure people are only paid for results, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, we could we could start a, a an epicenter vault that has all the projects that we have on the podcast. <laughs> See how that plays out. <laughs> Bullish, I'll buy it. <laughs> but, but I think that's actually a quite interesting a sort of compounding mechanism to just uh, governance per se, right? And that comes out to what you just said before, Brian. Like sometimes, uh, you know, you cannot let everybody decide for everything, right? Like you will need to have specialized expertise uh, to make to make sure things function. And I think uh, you know you can you can even think about that in terms of you know the the prices low, right? Like, and then if you look at the prices low, they say like that fifty percent of the work is done by the square root of the total number of people who participate in the work, which basically means ten percent of the people have fifty percent of the result. So like you want to create incentives which are targeting those 10% of the people, right? And, uh, and, and make sure they are, yeah, they are basically incentivized based on the results. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I pretty think- Pretty bullish on KPI options. I think they are going to be great. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think in the end, right, what you are having here is, um, you know, you're trying to do something, like trying to produce like create products, trying to create, uh, you know, get users, build something, you know, in a decentralized way, right? So of course you have to have people who then uh, contribute to it and get rewarded somehow. And I mean, that's like a challenge in a centralized uh, traditional company. It's not easy to sort of say, oh, who contributed how much and compensate people fairly. And now if you have it in a decentralized context, of course it gets... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably even trickier at, at this point, at least, right? Because we don't have a lot of the tools. Um, so, yeah, I think the K KPI, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense, I think, as a sort of, yeah, way of incentivizing and rewarding uh, people. Of course, tricky too, right? Because often maybe you should, maybe the KPI can be slightly off and then sort of, you know, then, well, if you have a KPI option, right, people are going to try to like, optimize around that KPI. And if that really matches right, what you're That's trying right. to accomplish, mm -hmm. great, right? But if it's like slightly off, I then- think You're correct. Like people will definitely optimize for that KPI. And that opens like a, also an interesting question, which is like within a decentralized organization, which has, it's, you know, leaderless, like you have to make decision, you know, almost based on, on, on the advice process instead of the chain of command, right? Like to token holders are not like, a, you know, they are not going to decide where to go. Like, it's more like, you know, you have a community of people uh, who want to implement uh, different things. 
right? And you need to have systems to make sure those people have that opportunity first. But like you can still like, it's, it's important that there is like a governance layer on top because otherwise uh, you don't have any good point of intervention before things get too far, like and they're going, you know, badly, right? Uh, but that's, that's pretty important because like that opens like an, an, a wide opportunity for people to experiment and also create a, a whole lot of different things. I think, you know, you were mentioning sort of traditional ETF before, and I think one of the main differences that we're going to see between traditional products and on-chain products is that the cost of production is, you know, extremely minimal when you see a on-chain product, right? Like uh, rolling out a, a regulated ETF uh, will take millions of dollars, only in compliance, right? Uh, without even talking about, uh, you know, licenses and, and all these kind of things. But on-chain, uh, that takes minutes, right? Like and, and peanuts from a cost perspective. Uh, what what that means though is that like you might end up with a bunch of different products which are not really working out great, and that's why you need to optimize for specific, you know, performance indicator. So in that sense, I think that works. Uh, it's going to work out pretty well. But I do expect to see a lot of experimentation uh, in that sense. I think we are just so early on uh, to see what what is going to happen. So let's talk about the oven a little bit, because this, I think, is a really interesting piece of this product. Uh, describe what, what the oven does and um, how people are using it. Right. Now, the oven is, um, it's basically, this comes like we have been looking uh, at, at how people were using pies. Like, and eventually we realized that uh, minting pies might not be accessible to anyone. Uh, just because the cost of, of the gas is going to be so expensive, right? Like Ethereum right now, the, the block space within the Ethereum blockchain is in very high demand. Uh, as such, uh, like uh, gas price will spike uh, pretty often. Uh, now, since uh, these products contain like a, basically a large amount of different tokens, like uh, that will become a little bit costly over time. Uh, as such, we have been pretty much designing a batching mechanism. And you can think about that as a, you know, as using your own car versus getting into a bus, right? Like it's, uh, it's going to be just cheaper, like if we get 10, 20 people into a single bus and then, uh, you know, make sure they all go to the same place. That's what the oven does. You deposit your if into it. Uh, when some threshold uh, is, is basically crossed, then uh, uh, the oven will bake. And then by baking, we'll create the pie for everyone and then give it to, to the people. It's a similar concept of how rollups work or sort of other L2 to some degree. Okay, so so essentially, you know, by by, by having you use the oven though, there's there's a time sensitivity. Uh, you, you can't be time sensitive. Like you have to be prepared to wait the you time have to be prepared that to this work. batching will happen. And like how often does this batching happen? Uh, it actually happens based on trigger. So like there is a minimum requirement of 10 if within the oven to to start baking, like, and then the gas will be subsidized uh, by the DAO, which means that the users only pay the gas to deposit into the oven to withdraw uh, if they want to. Um, but like the entire baking is subsidized by the DAO. Um, it depends on the, yeah, it depends on the moment, right? Like sometimes you will be baking happens within hours. Uh, sometimes it can take a couple of days. But in, in any sense, like I think we are estimating right now that if you do bake through the oven, you have up to 72, 78, it depends on the number of tokens uh gas savings in doing that wow that's like pretty impressive so you know before before we get to you know talking a little bit about the future of um of PyDAO, like I i'd like to maybe take it to a more practical side like so you know some someone who's holding eth today you know can choose the old eth and just gain from like the um the increase increase in price in eth you know, what are some, you know, strategies for, uh, you know, optimizing the returns that you can get on that ETH? And like, if someone say just, you know, very plainly, like someone had a hundred ETH, what would you recommend as, you know, like low, medium or high risk strategies uh, with regard, like as far as PyDAO is concerned? Right. So like, it, I think you can look at it from a perspective, like I was mentioning before uh, that we do pretty intense work in treasury management, right? Right now, uh, Pydao, like, is sort of managing uh, his own treasury, which is, uh, I think, close to 18 million uh, or something, and that's where the yield comes from. And we do employ a variety of different strategies uh, within sort of the ETH exposure. Uh, we consider to be sort of base, like, risk-free exposure, 
um, sort of staking for if 2.0, either through tokenized platform like Lido or something like that. Uh, we consider that to be sort of the base benchmark. And, um, and then we do employ, uh, you know, a couple of other uh, strategies into that. So like you could, besides like just putting that stuff in Lido, you can participate into liquidity pools and then have that on Curve, for instance, and even stake those positions uh, into something like convex finance, which will yield you an additional layer of fees uh, or additional layer of tokens through the CBX incentive program. Uh, that's already like kind of in the medium risk strategy, like, but it will yield uh, a little bit more. Uh, and that's a pretty interesting one. Uh, otherwise you get to even you know, more complex stuff like uh, setting portfolio of options, or uh, which is something which we also do uh, within the uh, Pidow Treasury working group. So like the good thing about all this stuff is that, you know, you have 100 if like, and then you have, you have to decide all these different sort of risk profile, you know, which allocation put in each one of the risk profile. And then there is a lot of research involved, right? So we kind of, <laughs> we kind of abstract this entire process for DAO holders to some degree, because like when they get into the DAO uh, staking program, like uh, they get the benefit of all of this, right? Because we manage the treasury, uh, we do the research, like uh, the community does the research, employs the different strategies, and then people just get the payout, uh, which I think it's it's quite interesting. Like you can even think about that as almost uh, getting a carry from from a fund uh, to some degree by by working on it, where it usually happens only for the GP. Like this happens for each one within the the group. Yeah. So different strategies on if uh, you know you can low risk just like yeah. Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah, one, one thing I'm curious about, I mean, Pi, so far we've always talked about like Ethereum. Uh, do you guys have plans to extend Pi to like other blockchains or like, you know, kind of include assets like non-Ethereum assets? Right, like non-Ethereum assets are, well, first of all, like we, need, we have to have them bridged into Ethereum somehow, like for that to happen. And, uh, and that would be like one of the first things, but it's definitely something we are interested in too, like and it can happen in a variety of different way, either through synthetic asset or wrapped version, right? Like, and that's the case. We already use WBTC after all, like in a couple of different allocations. So that's definitely possible. Uh, there, are, uh, there is a lot of talking within the community of going into a variety of different L2. And I think that's something which is gonna happen pretty soon. Um, and yeah, the moment like we, we, we find out what is sort of the best uh, formula for doing that, because like the, what I find particularly interesting about PyDAO in L2 is that you can provide to L2 users like a layer of additional fees that they would be getting on L1, which they cannot, right? So you're kind of double yielding, right? You get a, you get a Pi, which is already yielding like 10% APR because it's using so many strategies, and then you bridge that into an L2, like, and then uh, uh, you don't only give the exposure, but you can use that in a variety of different protocols over there. So I think that's the direction we're gonna uh, we're gonna go uh, for all, yeah, for all that regards, like L2 and different chains. So what's the um, what's the future here? I know you've you've got a roadmap, sort of roadmap for the next few quarters uh, post uh, up on the medium. Uh, walk us through so so the things that are uh, coming up in PyDAO. Right, so yeah, like the, the very first uh, uh, focus right now is to, well, we want to get to a very large percentage of the network staked. I think that's like potentially one of the most important thing uh, that we are uh, all working as a community towards to, uh, because it's incentivized, but also because it's good for the community itself. There are a couple of different products which are gonna be pretty exciting. One give, uh, gives basically full vertical exposure to all the different L2 solution and it's called scale uh, and it will give you stuff like you know optimism like or you know, polygon and whatnot so like you can make a vertical bet on all the different uh, scaling solution without having to pick one um, same uh, nft founds something we've been you know thinking quite a lot and we're looking forward to have them uh, you know making into our reality um, by the way, shout out to the uh, Winter Beer community because like their art club is is being very helpful in defining that that allocation as well. And uh, more generally speaking, uh, I'm looking forward to see uh, tokenization of some of the strategies that uh, the Treasury Working Group has been working on 
uh, within the couple of, you know, the, the last few months. Like they have been extremely effective in generating yield and then they outperformed the benchmarks by, you know, by a lot. So like, I'm very excited to see that uh, being tokenized into their own, uh, set of their own strategies. And, uh, and that's definitely uh, happening very soon. Uh, from an organizational perspective, uh, we have been uh, working on, yeah, pretty much creating like uh, uh, all the different structures which uh, will enable the organization to scale and have, uh, you know, more and more full-time token holder get on board, like, and, and make sure they can make their best work. So I'm quite excited about that. Uh, it's been a long process, like it's now working pretty smoothly. Um, and also like, I want to <laughs> shout out to Adrian for like leading most of these efforts. And uh, yeah, so like a, a lot more products coming out, a lot more related to, you know, benefit to the VDO stakers, which is, uh, uh, you know, they, they they will see very soon. And uh, yeah, and, and a couple of new pies on the line. And uh, where should people go to uh, find out more about PyDAO and perhaps get involved? Like what, what are some of your calls to the community here that you'd like, you know, people to uh, to check out? Yeah, so like for, First thing first, like, you know, definitely go and check it out our Discord. Like, it's a pretty uh, an active Discord. You can find it in pydao.org. Like, just uh, go into the footer area, like, you will find a link to Discord. And regarding getting involved, like, we recently rolled out a completely new bounty program, which is uh, enabling you to earn uh, some more dough and then uh, participate actively into the community. Uh, that's, uh, like, probably the, the fastest and more interesting way uh, to go deeper uh, into the community and get, you know, into an actionable stage, uh, earn your way through the DAO, like earn a reputation. So definitely go and check out like the bounty um, board. Like there are a number of tasks which are both, you know, for technical people and non-technical people. So feel free to, to just jump in, like and participate within the community. For all the rest, uh, there is a governance forum, which is a forum.pydao.org, when you're going to see all the governance happening for the vast majority and uh, and what decisions are made. And I think otherwise, like hit me up on Twitter, like, and then, you know, I will guide you through. Cool. cool. Thanks well, so much. We'll link to uh, all those resources and uh, definitely link to PyDAO and your Twitter. Um, thanks for joining us today, Alex. Thank you very much, guys. Like, it's been a pleasure. Like, uh, uh, good job on the podcast. I'm a fan. Uh, off to speak up soon again. Yeah, thanks so much, Alex. Looking forward to it. Cheers.